So we'll go ahead and get us started. So um, as the attendees are, are jumping on board, I'll just kind of introductions and kind of let everybody know what we're up to. So welcome to the virtual community lecture series for Newport Hospital for March. I'm very excited to have uh, Kristen Wojewski as well as Maria Guillermo, who are part of our Department of Neurosurgery. And um, really the nice thing about this format is that we can give them a chance to do a little presentation about some of the great work they're doing at Newport. And then as the attendees, you can use the Q&A box or the chat box. They both work and I'll be keeping track of both of them. So I'll be the moderator. Um, for those I haven't met, my name is Jeff Gaines. I'm the chief medical officer at Newport Hospital and I'm an emergency physician by background. So I'll know a little bit of the ER stuff and I'll know some of the hospital wide stuff if you have questions about those. And then our Kristen and Maria will be able to answer more of the neurosurgery and spine related items. Um, and so excited to have them. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. These, um, these community lecture series have been really well received. I've gotten a lot of really great feedback and we've covered things from some of your colleagues in the physical medicine rehabilitation space, like Dr. Kamal and Dr. Fields. We had Mike Mason do some uh, cool testimonials of patients and things on what he does in total joint. Um, we've had infectious disease folks like uh, Francine Tuzard-Romo and Gail Jackson did a little thing right at the pandemic and the influenza season we're hitting. So we've had some pretty timely topics. And I think as spring is coming around and the weather is getting nicer and people are getting more active, I think um, people will remember that they had aches and pains and arthritis and injuries and things like that. So unfortunately, your business, I'm sure, will pick back up. And then the people that have been um, waiting patiently to get surgery, for example, um, with all the pandemic and they're getting vaccinated, I think there'll be a, a wave of people that will be seeking care that has probably long been overdue. So I think this, this discussion will be just as timely as the other. So I really appreciate you guys taking some time this evening. Um, just for the, uh, the panelists and the, or the attendees rather that are watching, I um, will introduce folks. So um, Kristen Wojcicki is a nurse practitioner. She's board certified. Um, her main areas of interest, she's, uh, her board certification is in acute care adult gerontology. Um, she did her undergrad in um, her BSN at Rhode Island College and then went back and did her graduate degree there and completed their nurse practitioner um, program at Rhode Island College. And um, like Dr. Guillermo, her interests are really adult spine surgery, neurosurgical treatments for chronic pain. Um, she has a particular interest in um, patients who have intrathecal pain pumps. So if you have questions about that, we can certainly talk about that as well. Um, and she's also done some research in that area as well. And so we're excited to have her on board. Um, and we typically like to have uh, kind of a nurse physician dyad. So um, Kristen's um, dyad partner is Dr. Maria Guillermo, who is a, a neurosurgeon and she works at Newport Hospital, but is also with the Norman Prince Neuroscience Institute, which as you may know, is our lifespan system-wide neurosciences program. Um, about five or six years ago now, we brought some of the neurosurgical um, expertise from Lifespan in the Providence area down to Newport. Um, and we're excited to have Dr. Guillermo join our team. Um, she got her undergraduate degree from Yale University and then her MD from the Brown Dartmouth Medical Program and then did general surgery internship and neurosurgical residency right here at the Brown Program for neurosur Neurological Surgery. Um, so similar to Kristen, her interests um, really predominantly adult spine surgery and neurosurgical treatments for pain. Um, she also does research and has some publications in those areas as well as um, traumatic brain injury and other areas as well. So um, lots of credentials and letters and alphabet soup after each of their names. So thank you for all that hard work you put in on the front end so that um, the people of Newport can have access to such expertise it's really unusual, quite frankly, for a small community hospital to have access to such high level neurosurgical care. Um, and so I think it's really fantastic. And quite frankly, there um, years ago before it was in Newport, a lot of patients would have to travel up to Providence or Boston or to Connecticut or elsewhere to re receive some of the higher level neurosurgical care or even just evaluations to determine if surgery might be appropriate or not for them. So to have that right in our own backyard and have it so easily accessible has been tremendous. Um, and we've seen um, people vote with the, the tongues in their shoes instead of the tongues in their mouths and they show up. Um, and so they've really been um, taking advantage of that service at Newport. So thank you for being a part of that team and for doing surgeries and cases there. Um, Dr. Guillermo also is a, um, assistant professor of neurosurgery up in Providence with the Brown University and the medical school. And she also serves as the director for neurosurgery at Kent Hospital and operates there quite a bit. Um, as well as a few other roles in and around the community. You have a lot of hats, so you can certainly speak to that as well. So um, we're very fortunate to have both of you here. And so I will turn it over to you in a minute. 
Um, and then just to remind everybody that if you have questions right now, you won't be able to unmute yourself. But for those that just joined um, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat bubble and a Q&A, which has two bubbles. I'll open those up in a second. And so if you have questions, even throughout the presentation, um, please go ahead and enter them into those boxes. And then I will um, bring them up when there's a little pause in the presentation. And then at the end, we'll save a little time for Q&A and I can either read questions off if, if people feel more comfortable, or if you'd like, um, I can unmute folks and allow them to ask their questions that way. So that's kind of how the, the logistics of it will work. Um, and the team here was nice enough to put together a little presentation. So I am gonna put that up. And then I will clam up and let our experts do the talking, but please, please feel free to ask questions if they come up. And thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm um, uh, Maria Guillermo, and um, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon at Brown, and I'm uh, part of the surgical part of the neurosurgical team at the uh, Norman Prince Institute here at Newport. Um, and I have my great partner with me, Kristen, um, who uh, is uh, helps me both in the clinic and in the operating room. And uh, she actually, in her previous life, was an operating room nurse before she became a nurse practitioner. So she's got a lot of, um, got a lot of experience there and is a huge help. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is, um, uh, you know, spend about, um, 20 minutes or so, maybe a little longer, um, going uh, through a presentation. Um, uh, I'm uh, probably gonna skim over some of the parts and focus maybe a little bit more on features that might, and topics that might be interest, of interest to the community, um, particularly presentation, how, how to recognize uh, some of the symptoms of these spinal issues um, and issues regarding uh, treatment, as, as well as exciting news about um, uh, new developments and new directions that we're going in. So um, uh, this talk is going to focus on spinal stenosis. Stenosis means narrowing. And we're going to be talking about the spinal canal uh, in the neck, the upper back and the lower back um, and uh, problems that cause a narrowing um, and, and therefore symptoms, uh, pain, disability, weakness, numbness. Um, and uh, so I think we'll move on to the next slide and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it. So as I said, um, spinal stenosis refers to narrowing of the bony canal and the skeleton. And, um, and our spine uh, both supports and protects the spinal cord and the nerve roots. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, with degeneration, um, we can see problems with that support structure, weakness, compression, um, and spinal stenosis is a quite common problem. Uh, it generally is a problem for patients over 50, and it's more commonly caused by osteoarthritis. Uh, this would be a common condition which can cause bone spurs and joint problems in other parts of the body. And I'll go to the next slide. So this is kind of the outline of the talk. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy because it's a little hard to understand um, uh, what a, a physician or a surgeon might be talking about when they're discussing where your pain is coming from without an understanding of how everything's put together. Um, we're gonna talk briefly about the different areas of the spine. I'm gonna focus a lot on the cervical and lumbar because degenerative stenosis is most common in those two areas. Um, the clinical syndromes are what the patients experience. Uh, a little bit about diagnosis and testing. And we'll talk about different treatment options, including surgery. Um, uh, I have something called clinical pearls. Often that's often for my younger medical colleagues um, or maybe colleagues outside of neurosurgery, but um, pearls are, are just uh, sort of a beautiful, important point. Um, something that when you've had experience for a long time, it's one of the first things you wanna teach someone when they're learning about it. So um, forgive me for throwing in some medical, medical, medical lingo there. So I'll go to the next slide, um, which is spinal anatomy, and we'll go on. Um, so this is a sort of a simple cartoon um, of our spinal column. And there's three curves, um, the cervical curve, which, is, which has lordosis, um, and the thoracic curve, which has kyphosis, kind of curving in the other way. And then again, we're curving back into the lordosis of the lumbar spine. Um, humans are upright, 
uh, animals and we walk on two legs and that causes us a lot of problems with our spine uh, because of that upright uh, posture. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so this is breaking it down into components. And uh, in this particular view, we're kind of looking at uh, the vertebral bodies and discs, kind of uh, what makes up the spine. And you can see kind of a view from the side or the lateral view where there are two bones stacked on one another, interconnecting, and there's a, a soft pillow in between them called the disc. Um, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, you can look at it from the top down and you can kind of cut through that disc and see there's kind of outer fibers and a softer center. Um, so you basically have bony structures that protect, joints that allow movement, and a pillow or a disc that, uh, that absorbs shock. Um, and you know all of those components can have issues or problems um, uh, that can cause pain or other issues with the patient. So going to the next side, um, we have a cross section of the cervical spine. Um, uh, in, the, in the cervical spine or in the neck, um, the spine is housing and, and is kind of a house for the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is a solid structure, as you see in there, and it's going to contain information coming to and from the brain, going to the arms, the legs, the bowel, the bladder, sort of everything. So um, the cervical spine often uh, worries us more when we're thinking about stenosis or pressure against it because uh, one, it's a solid structure. It can't move out of the way like the sack of nerves lower down. And two, um, damage to the spinal cord in the neck can affect functions of both the arms and the legs. Um, so I'm not gonna go into every uh, detail there on that picture, but often with patients, I will describe this picture as sort of a house with kind of the, the, the tip of the house and the roof being the lamina. Um, inside the house, you have the spinal cord that you're protecting, and there's a door on the right side and the left side where the nerve roots are coming out. And then we have the strong basement, which is either the bone, the vertebral body, or that disc, that shock absorber we were talking about. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, this is uh, another drawing. Uh, this is now in the lumbar spine. Um, where we have that similar view of the house. Um, this is actually showing um, an abnormal view where the, the, the space in the house is not nice and round, it's narrowed, it's more of a triangle. And in the lumbar spine, in, in most patients, we would have a sack of nerves that can move out of the way a little bit better than the spinal cord can, but after a while, uh, the nerves have had enough and, and they're gonna let you know that, that they're hurting. So we'll go on to the next slide. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the anatomy of spinal stenosis. Uh, we can go on here. Uh, we're going to start with the neck. So as I mentioned, um, the cervical stenosis can affect both the arms and the legs. Um, cervical myelopathy is a term that basically means uh, a problem with the spinal cord in the neck where the spinal cord has, has damage. Um, and symptoms can include hand weakness, hand numbness, Walking problems can include bladder symptoms. So one of the issues with that is cervical stenosis can present like a lot of other things. Uh, people can have walking problems um, and you might think it's from their lower back. People can have numbness in their hands and you might think it's carpal tunnel. Um, and uh, the bad news is, is you might have both cervical stenosis and stenosis in your lower back or cervical stenosis and carpal tunnel or other problems. So it can be complex. Um, so uh, cervical stenosis can also produce pain more in one or two nerve roots with shooting pain, you know, often down the arm, numbness or weakness. So I'll go on to the next slide. Um, and, and here we're talking more about narrowing for uh, a particular nerve, as I said, um, cervical radiculopathy, which a lot of people would call, call a pinch nerve in the neck. Um, and that can be from a disc, it can be from bone spurs, um, and uh, oftentimes uh, that can, when it's not able to be successfully treated with conservative treatments, we can have very good luck alleviating that severe, horrible pain down the arm with surgery. So we'll go on to the next slide. 
um, which is kind of a, a sort of a picture that uh, when you're a medical student, you have to memorize and know where all the nerve roots go. I'll skip over that and go to the next slide there. Um, and I'm gonna go through these next slides fairly quickly. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the next one. This is just some description of the different nerve roots. Um, uh, I'll move on to the next slide in the mid and lower cervical spine and kind of what symptoms they produce. And I'll move on to the next slide there and the next slide after that. Um, this is a nice picture. Um, uh, what you're looking at is an MRI scan. So an MRI scan is a magnet scan. Um, it does not use radiation. Um, it uses magnetic properties to produce a 3D image inside your body. Uh, MRI scans, because they require so much magnetic energy, most of them tend to be fairly small spaces. So sometimes it's a challenge for patients who have claustrophobia to get the studies. Um, but they produce these beautiful pictures. So here we have a sideways view of a patient. Um, and the gray stripe you see surrounded by white is the, is the spinal cord. Um, and you see, if you can see sort of in the middle, it looks like there's sort of a pinching there. And so that hole for the spinal cord has been pinched and that is the, the cervical stenosis. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. And again, we, we talked about some of these syndromes. So people can have diffuse aching or burning in their arms and hands. They can report that they're having trouble doing fine movements with their hands. They're having trouble buttoning buttons. Uh, they used to be able to sew or, or do work with models or puzzles and they can't. Um, and sometimes patients may have these symptoms and may chalk them up to old age and may, and may not you know, get an evaluation for it. Um, people may have walking problems. And again, gait problems can come from many different things. So this is something to consider. Uh, uh, when I'm examining the patients, there might be certain findings on physical exam that I'm looking for, but a lot of times the testing, including the MRI is gonna be the most definitive test. I'm gonna move on to the next slide there. And I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, thoracic stenosis is, is relatively rare. Um, there's a lot of other problems that can happen with the, the thoracic spine, but in terms of degenerative stenosis, it's uncommon. Um, uh, and it, it typically would produce symptoms in the lower extremities, the legs, but typically would not um, uh, produce problems in the arms because those nerve roots have come off in the neck. So we'll move on to lumbar stenosis, which is a very, very common disorder um, and a very large part of my practice. So in the lumbar spine, um, it's protecting the end of the spinal cord um, and the spinal nerve roots. So the um, anatomists of years ago who um, you know, gave us the knowledge that we now build upon thought that when they looked at a cadaver and looked at these nerve roots you know, in a, in a, in a human body and, and in the anatomy lab, that they looked like a horse's tail. So um, uh, of course at the time, you know, we, we use, and we still do, we use Latin for a lot of medical terms. So the cauda equina um, or the horse's tail uh, is this, um, these nerve roots that go down. Um, so with narrowing, you, you have pressure against this cauda equina and these nerve roots. Um, one very common syndrome uh, would be pain in the back, buttocks and legs. And very characteristically, it would be worse with walking. People would say, I just can't walk anymore. I have to sit down all the time. You know, I can't do things I wanna do. You know, I'm constantly sitting and resting. Um, uh, people might say that bending forward um, helps them, you know, because that opens up the space a little bit. So I'll move on to the next slide. Um, uh, this is talking about a little bit of a different syndrome, which can be related, which is again, a pinch nerve in the back. And this tends to be shooting pain down the leg. Uh, sometimes if it's from a disc herniation, you might, people might say, I can't sit. Every time I sit, my leg is just killing me and walking is actually more comfortable for them. So sometimes you can distinguish, um, uh, you know, different problems. Uh, by the history. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people have both. They have problems with a bulging or herniated disc and they have stenosis on top of it. Um, uh, oftentimes we're looking at the lower lumbar area where, where um, you know, the weight of the whole body is on there and that's where a lot of these problems develop. So um, I'll go on to the next slide there. Um, and I think I'm gonna skip through these pretty quickly. These are just to, you know, again, a lot of different pictures 
um, of the specific nerve roots. Um, we've talked a lot about central stenosis, lumbar stenosis, so I'll go forward here. Um, and here we have um, another one of these nice MRI pictures. Now here we have a, a picture from the side, kind of cutting through from the side, and another picture that's kind of cutting through the middle, so almost like you're looking down at the person. And if you look on the right, it's a little hard to, to make out, but you can see that house that we talked about, but now it's upside down and the roof is down there. And there's very little room in that house. There is severe narrowing for the nerves. So this is severe uh, lumbar stenosis. So we'll move on to the next slide there. And I was waiting, <laughs> I kept forgetting where my shopping cart was. So this is the shopping, shopping cart sign, which is just uh, kind of a fun thing because it kind of sticks in medical students' minds. But it, it's also important that a, a lot of people will say, gee, I, I can still go to the grocery store because I lean forward on that cart. And if I don't lean forward on it, uh, my back and legs are, are killing me. Um, other people might say they, they use a walker or a wheeled walker for a similar purpose. So um, it, it's actually such a common complaint that it, it has its own, its own sign there. So I'll, I'll move forward there. Um, and go into diagnosing spinal stenosis. So we've, we've kind of talked about a lot of this. I mean, the first step is always to listen to the patient. Um, what is the patient's problem? Because if the patient's problem isn't pain in their legs and they're having trouble walking, maybe their back looks terrible, but their neck is worse and that's where they're having the problem. Um, or maybe the MRI looks terrible and the patient's doing pretty well. And, um, you know, I can tell them, you know, great news. We're not, you know, I don't think we're looking at surgery right now. Um, the examination can be helpful. And we talked uh, a little bit about some of the studies that help us with the MRI probably being the most helpful, but others of these are useful um, in different cases. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so this is something which, um, you know, again, I'm going to stress to medical students and uh, my younger neurosurgical colleagues as, as, as we're teaching, but it's important, I think, for people in the community to know about themselves or their loved ones. Um, most back pain is, is benign. You know, most time you, even when you have a terrible backache, um, it, it isn't anything really scary. And a lot of my primary care colleagues see tons of people with back problems and they get better. But there are what we call the red flags. That's like the flag you wave and the bull comes charging, which means that, hey, when somebody has one of these things and they have back pain, we're gonna be, we're gonna be worried, we're gonna be more concerned. So one of the first, of course, is a history of cancer or strong risk factors for cancer because cancer can spread to the bones of the spine and that can be, result in an emergency surgical situation. Um, if there's a history of infection, if people are on medicines that lower their immune system, uh, many people with diabetes have impaired um, uh, immune systems, that also is going to be a, a, red, a red flag. Um, again, listening to the patient is important. If the patient said, I was walking fine until three days ago, and, and now you know I can barely get around with a walker, that's a huge change, and we, we want to know what's going on. Obviously, if they've been in a, in a trauma or an accident, that's important. People with weak bones are more prone to fractures. And people who are on blood thinners, which is a lot of people um, uh, with the, the work our cardiologists and our medical doctors have done with preventing stroke and cardiac events, um, uh, we're going to be more cautious with those people. So um, we'll move on to the next uh, slide there. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we talked a little bit about the importance of, of imaging and, and neurosurgeons are very visual and we're always very focused on the x-rays and the MRI. We're gonna go on to the next slide there. And, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of other testing. There's nerve testing. Sometimes I'll, I'll do my own injections in the spine, not just to treat the pain, but also maybe to get a sense if I'm going to do surgery where the pain may be coming from. But it's really important to know that none of these things are a pain test. You know, there is some interesting technology coming out where we may be able to test for pain, but that's not quite with us yet. So a lot of times people may be very concerned. One, the MRI looks horrible, um, even though I feel fine. Um, or, you know, conversely, I have horrible pain, but they say there's not much on the MRI. Is, is, there, is this just something in my head? Is, you know, are people not going to believe me? And so it's important to realize that the imaging studies are, are a picture. And um, as I like to, you know, as, as it's an old adage in neurosurgery, um, you know, operate, you operate on the patient, you don't operate on their x-ray. So um, uh, it's important to, to realize that these tests as wonderful and, and technologically marvelous as they are, are, are not the whole picture. 
So we'll kind of go forward now um, and move on to surgery. I'm going to kind of do this pretty quickly. Um, there's a variety of non-surgical treatments and uh, my colleagues on the, on the medical side, the Spine Institute, uh, do wonderful work with this. I'm very interested in pain management myself and do some of my own uh, injections. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, and uh, I think surgery for spinal stenosis is a big decision. Um, uh, it's really important that the surgeon and the entire surgical team and the patient and their family understand what the goals are and what the risks are and, um, and what the alternatives are. Uh, so I'll keep uh, moving forward there to the next slide. And uh, in some cases, it may all be about pain and alleviating pain. In other cases, we may have someone who already has damage to their spinal cord and we just don't want it to get worse. And those are very different uh, goals. Uh, there are um, lo very large deformity surgeries, um, uh, which can reconstruct spines that have um, really horrific issues. Um, and a lot of my colleagues up at Rhode Island Hospital are doing these um, very large surgeries. I mean, some, some of them uh, are you know, 10, 12 hour marathons, so they're pretty amazing. Um, and, and in many cases, of course, we wanna fun focus on improving function and the quality of life, because in the end, that's really what we want. So I'll go forward here um, and I'm gonna kind of skip over this. Um, I'm getting to about 20 minutes there. Um, I, I will talk a little bit about how surgical procedures can, can, we can approach the spine in different ways. We have to, as you saw that, that spine is in the middle of a lot of stuff. So how do we get through it? So we can go in the back and take the roof off the house. We can go from the front, either through the belly or in the neck. Um, uh, so there's a lot of different approaches, but in the end, we want to make sure that we don't lose sight of why are we doing the surgery, what are our goals, what could go wrong, what are the risks, um, are the risks worth taking? And I, I think that's one of the most important things um, in surgery. So I'll, I'll go on from there and um, kind of skip over this is kind of a listing of some technical terms of things. I will just show some pictures here of a very common surgery where we're taking out a disc in the neck and um, putting a plate and bone plug in there. That's called an, an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Everybody kind of calls it by the alphabet soup of letters, ACDF. I'll move on to the next um, slide and um, kind of keep going from there, I think, if I have more cool pictures. Uh, this is just sort of an, another uh, MRI scan, and we're talking about a, a laminectomy where we're taking the roof off the house and maybe some of the side supports of the facets, and we're making that narrow hole, the stenosis, larger. Um, and a lot of times we get very good relief of the shooting pain down the legs. Uh, the next slide is, a, is kind of a, a schematic of, of some of the more complex surgeries involving screws and rods and I'll uh, go on from there. Um, and this is just a, a little um, a teaser about some of the new technologies and, and really spine is changing incredibly. One of the things is um, the ability to see in the spine and get imaging uh, like CAT scans while you're doing surgery. Um, so neuro navigation as it's known is really revolutionizing the spinal field. Um, we have the ability to target radiation into spinal tumors that were thought to be resistant to any type of radiation uh, with devices such as the cyber knife. Of course, we have fabulous vision due to our microscopes. Um, we have um, treatments for chronic pain, including neuromodulation. These are the so-called pacemakers for pain, a special interest of mine, where um, we can block pain signals from getting to the brain. And we also have the ability to monitor the patient's nerves in real time in the operating room with our team of neuromonitoring experts. So I'll go on to the next slide, which... Um, and I'll, I'll keep going from there. I keep um, seeing where my end is. So I'm just gonna kind of sum up cause I wanna give um, uh, Kristen some time to talk a little bit about, despite all this glorious technology, um, the patient is the center and, um, and the patient being the center is both, um, is, is, is both wonderful for the patient, but it's also a responsibility. So many risk factors for poor outcomes in spinal surgery are related to lifestyle and they can be controlled and they can be improved. 
So smoking is a huge negative um, in terms of outcomes for spinal surgery. Um, obesity, decon deconditioning, um, people who may have substance abuse issues and may be afraid to share them with their provider. It's so important that we know of all, all of this going in and can work with you to kind of help minimize these risks and get a better outcome. So um, education about the process is incredibly helpful for both the patients and their caregivers. And it's a two-way street. You know, I need to be educated about your life and your symptoms and, and you need... And um, you know, I need to educate you about what I can do and also what I can't do. So realistic goals and expectations are really critical. So I'll go on from there. And I'll, um, uh, this is just kind of like more uh, technical stuff for um, some of my medical colleagues. So I'll, I'll kind of go on to the last slide. Um, and I'll just sum up by saying that uh, degenerative spinal stenosis is a very common uh, condition. Uh, it is more common in the older population. Um, uh, the symptoms can be managed with non-surgical approaches in many cases, but when uh, those fail, um, surgery can be very beneficial and can help with both function and pain. And um, I'm always a big advocate that active participation by the patient, um, uh, they're really our partner um, uh, with the medical team and as well as their caregivers and their family. You know, we're all working together and we all wanna um, uh, get the best results. Uh, with our with our surgeries and our non-surgical treatments. So I appreciate everybody uh, uh, listening to that whole talk there. I'm going to um, pause for a moment. Um, Jeff, do you think we should do some questions and then go to Kristen or how do you feel it should work? Yeah, what, um, what I'll do is I'll just remind everybody, let me put my video back on again too. I didn't want to distract. Um, so this is everybody that's an attendee, your opportunity. We have some neuro neurosurgical experts on the line and how often do you get a chance to sit and ask questions of neurosurgeons and neurosurgical specialists? So please take this opportunity to ask some questions. Um, one question that I um, saw come across that I wanted to pose to you is, um, you know, when we're you're talking about people that have back pain a lot of times is, um, is pretty benign, but do you have any kind of suggestions as to what, what would be the threshold to sort of seek care? When would be the time to go see a doctor? Anything, I know you mentioned a few red flags, but how do you help make that decision of when it's time to go get your back pain, um, for example, checked by a doctor? Right, well, cert certainly if you're concerned about your back pain and, and you're worried about it, it's good to get that objective evaluation. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you're pretty healthy, you have pain primarily in your back, um, you don't have any of those red flags, and your primary doctor says, hey, let's, let's try some natural treatments, see how it goes. We're not going to rush into a lot of multi-million dollar imaging. Um, uh, you, you know, that, that's fine. And now then on the other hand, if you start changing, you're developing more significant or worrisome symptoms. You're like, I, my foot is flopping. I can't lift up my foot, or I'm suddenly having trouble controlling my bladder. Um, uh, you know, it was just back pain, but, you know, I also have a fever, you know, and I have a history of an infection. So um, uh, sometimes even, you know, a, an initial benign presentation can become more concerning. Um, I think that if it's interfering with your life, getting an evaluation is, is, is important. Oftentimes, if I'm seeing a patient and there aren't red flags, um, uh, and uh, I will often start um, with, with my physical therapy colleagues, with natural treatments, um, and then when we get to the point where I say, well, gee, if there's something on the MRI, um, myself and the patient might want to intervene, um, then that's when the imaging becomes crucial. All right, so we'll watch out for that back pain plus if you have extra things on top of it or worsening for sure. Um, awesome. Well, we'll hand it over to Kristen. So um, there's a couple more questions that are coming up, but why don't I give you a chance because I want to make sure we have a chance to hear from you as well. And then I'll fire off a few more questions and we'll go from there. One thing, too, that I wanted to talk about um, was definitely in regards to patients after surgery, too. You know, um, it's really a stepwise approach to surgical intervention with stenosis. You know, um, I would say one thing that, you know, it's important to remember is that, you know, for every, you know, sometimes patients take two steps forward. They start to feel really great. They start to do a little extra and they start to feel a little cruddy the next day or so, you know, and it's not every day is going to be perfect when you have stenosis and things like that. 
Um, from a nursing standpoint too, it's just really important to have patients up, you know, early in the hospital, early ambulation and working closely with the team, such as physical therapy is also extremely helpful. Um, I found that sometimes patients really benefit from even working with physical therapy in regards to utilizing good back ergonomics. Uh, anytime you have an injury too, or even stenosis, sometimes if you have an area of your back anywhere where it hurts, you tend to modify and try to compensate for that treatment. So utilizing good back ergonomics and techniques for moving things, you know, is very helpful too, you know, for patients. And I think a lot of them have gotten really good feedback from a good site that actually Dr. Guillermo had mentioned to me, which was called knowyourback.org. Uh, there was a lot of helpful information on there as well. And I think that, you know, discussing everything with, you know, patients with their families and taking like a stepwise approach is a very important thing when you're working with back pain candidates and patients. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's definitely a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And that's why I think we're really fortunate to have our real comprehensive spine center at Newport because we have neurosurgery. We have some of our interventional spine folks. We have the therapists. We have some of the rehab folks. So lots of different disciplines that can help. And of course, tying together primary care and um, some of the orthopedics and sports and other colleagues that often can help folks identify when they need to come and when they need to get help. Um, so all sorts of questions coming up now, which is great. So I'll fire a couple of them out and I'll let you guys decide who wants to take the first crack at them. Um, Loriana, part of my team um, put in, if an older parent is walking hunched over and their low back is stiff, might there be a good reason um, and they want to be seen in your office? Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, sort of access referrals. How do you get patients in to see you? What's the best process? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to sort of see anyone at any stage, um, you know, of their evaluation. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm working with the Spine Institute and uh, also doing some of the pain management interventions. Um, so if, if someone comes in and uh, they haven't had a lot of imaging or other options, I'm going to start with some, some of the basics of the history and physical and then uh, go on from there. Um, oftentimes, of course, patients will have seen their primary care doctor. They may have had some basic imaging or more advanced imaging. They'll have had some physical therapy and things are not getting better. And so then we're, we're kind of going in thinking, gee, we might be talking about invasive options from the beginning, or at least offering those to the patient. Um, so, uh, uh, typically the referrals, um, uh, might might come directly to me, and, and many of the primary care doctors are just wonderful about referring me patients. Uh, the Spine Institute in general, of course, is fantastic, and we've got a great team there of physiatrists, um, anesthesia pain doctors, a wonderful nurse practitioner. Um, so there's a there's a lot of talent there and and access. So um, I'd encourage people who have issues or problems. We're happy to see you and and do the evaluation. I mean, so, someone who who. So is hunching forward, that may be because it's too painful to stand up, or it may be because there's a deformity in the spine, or there could be both. So, you know, that would be an example of someone where there, there seems to be some significant pathology um, going on, just, just hearing that history. And we'd be, you know, I'd be quite more concerned about that one than somebody saying, you know, I'm 30 years old and I just shoveled out my whole driveway in a surprise storm and my back is killing me, you know? So, um, so I do think that's someone where an evaluation would be warranted. Excellent. Thank you. And um, just to make life easy, if you do go to either lifespan.org or to newporthospital.org, you can navigate to the Norman Prince Spine Institute and there you'll find all of the phone numbers and access information and the bios and info about the team and things like that. So I would encourage you if you have um, more curiosity to navigate to newporthospital.org and you'll be able to find your way there. A um, bunch more questions. So I want to make sure we get to these. Um, there's a question from an anonymous attendee that said, um, is there a treatment that involves um, spinal implants, drugs, electrodes, things like that? So maybe you could speak a little bit more to some of the um, sort of quasi-surgical implants, electrodes, those sorts of procedures. Sure. So I, I think the term implant is kind of broad. So certainly there's a lot of um, surgery where you're putting in an implant that's that that it's not necessarily what we call a functional surgery. You're putting in screws and rods. You're, you're putting in an artificial disc. You're you know you're putting in things to kind of restore the structure. Um, but if, if your goal is to modulate pain, uh, what we call neuromodulation, then you're putting in a, a functional unit and it is called functional neurosurgery. So in spine,
spine um, are the most, the most common treatments uh, would be the spinal cord stimulators or pacemakers for pain, which um, what a very common indication would be maybe someone who had multiple spine surgeries, they're not doing well, they're persistent back and leg pain. And the technology there has really, really improved over the past um, five to seven years with some great new uh, computer modules and we're getting a lot better relief with them. Um, uh, in terms of, of implants for medication, uh, that would be the, the what we're calling the pumps or the intrathecal pumps, meaning that the medicine is going directly into the spinal fluid. Um, you know, Kristen does great work uh, with our pump patients, um, uh, both ones with, with pain, like we're talking about today, and then also baclofen. So I don't know if you want to jump in, Kristen, and make a bird's eye view of, of the pumps. Uh, one thing about the pumps, you know, Patients have undergone a little information in regards to the actual pumps. One thing that is important and very crucial in, you know, evaluating for a pump candidate, um, some studies have been done that we've looked at, and the patients that have undergone a trial injection without any opiates in their system, you know, have a better success rate, actually, when pumps have been implanted, as far as getting better, you know, medication coverage and better pain relief afterwards. Um, you know, I found that a lot of times that is really true with patients and they've been able to been on, you know, be able to be on a micro dosing uh, regimen for their pain medication. And they do have a lot of good pain relief with the pumps. Um, you know, these are patients that are very dedicated to, you know, coming into the office for their, you know, evaluations and making sure that they stay on top of their refills. And we have a device, which is a basically a communication device to the pump, which is a tablet that we utilize. So we can read information from the pumps as well. Maybe you guys could speak for a minute. Oh, sorry, about um, epidural spinal injections. Teresa Antone asked about um, how effective are they and when are those advisable too? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Just just to follow up on the pump, I, I think the implanted opioid pump is, is, is definitely not a first line treatment, but for some patients where all else has failed, it, it could be very valuable. Um, in terms of the epidural steroid injections, you know, they're kind of a mainstay of um, the treatment of spinal pathology. Um, we, we don't really have the greatest class one evidence for it. I mean, there's stronger class one evidence for some of the surgical procedures than that, but, but certainly um, we see um, a lot of benefit and we often try it before the surgical procedures. So the theory behind that is, is you're basically um, putting um, an anti-inflammatory medicine, um, a steroid medicine, cortisone medicine uh, over the nerves in an attempt to settle down inflammation and help with pain. Um, uh, and there's a, a variety of different uh, pain techniques, interventional techniques, um, ranging from something that's basically like an epidural a mom might have for a baby, you know, where the, the needle goes sort of over the sac kind of more in the midline and kind of spreads out. Um, I, I often am trying to get the needle like right over a specific nerve root and putting medicine because I'm, I'm also using it as kind of a test. Uh, and then there's some uh, interesting treatments using radiofrequency for pain from arthritic joints, the little tiny joints in the back. Um, so there's really a lot of exciting um, treatments there. Um, and uh, my, my uh, colleagues in the, in the uh, Spine Institute um, have a, really a great array of things that they can try. However, when you know those fail, that's that's oftentimes when we're thinking about surgical intervention. One more pump-related question: Pat Kidder asked if pumps can be used for anti-inflammatories, say for example, instead of opiates. If you don't have severe pain, do you ever use pumps for anything besides opiates, or that pretty much just an opiate thing? Um, yeah. So, so the pumps are FDA approved um, for only a few medications. One is baclofen, which is not for pain at all, but for spasticity. Um, and these are, um, we're very excited to be kind of uh, looking into doing some more work with Dr. Kamal and the Vanderbilt on, on those patients. Morphine is approved and there's a medication called Prealt, which is not technically an opioid, um, very expensive and not that widely used. So the short answer is these other medications are not FDA approved in the pump, although that does there are a lot of pumps in the United States that have off-label medications. I'm not aware of any attempts to try to use any sort of anti-inflammatory in the pumps. Um, I mean, we're limited here by, by limited data and um, the pump therapy does have quite a few risks, but the hope is that in the future, we might be able to use the technology to deliver much more efficacious medicines into the spinal fluid. 
Awesome. All right, we're going to throw a case your way if you're ready. We had a question from one of the listeners that says that I have stenosis of the cervical with swelling of the spinal cord. My gait is fine. My limbs are all working fine. I have a repeat MRI next week. I've read a horrible article about someone with stenosis becoming paralyzed. I'm a bit terrified to move around until next week. Is this a rare occurrence? So how do you counsel somebody like this who has the condition of the cervical spine that you were just talking about? And what should we be worried about? Well, I I think first off, that's a discussion I want to have with someone I've examined and looked at their imaging because uh, someone may have an MRI that's read as spinal stenosis where there's a little narrowing, the spinal cord looks fine. Um, And I I may say to them, look, I don't think you're any more likely to have a spinal cord injury than anyone else. And and I often emphasize we are all one accident away from a spinal cord injury. So, um, uh, you know, trauma prevention is really important. On the other hand, for people who have severe narrowing in the cervical region for the spinal cord, for people where there's already damage in the spinal cord, um, which you can see on the MRI, you know, that that is a much more concerning situation. Um, There can be a problem with the patient progressing and kind of getting worse over weeks, months, or years. But there is um, a type of spinal cord injury where a patient has um, a fall or maybe a whiplash type injury. And when they're brought to the emergency room, they have a spinal cord injury, um, but the CAT scan doesn't show any fractures, does show arthritis. And then the MRI will reveal that there was bruising of the spinal cord. And that's called central cord syndrome. And it, it can produce this very, very debilitating problem where people's hands are very weak, although they have some movements of their shoulders. So um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that panicking um, or not moving is needed, but I think it would be very important to follow up after the MRI, have a really good discussion. Um, I would certainly avoid extreme neck movements, be careful about slips and falls, wear your seatbelt, which all of us should do. Um, uh, but I definitely think that's something to have a detailed conversation about uh, on an individual level. Excellent. And then one step back from that, Anastasia asked about safe exercises for people with spinal stenosis. So assuming that there's nothing unstable or nothing really particularly alarming, um, are there particular exercises or things that you recommend to folks to be able to either help with treatment or just overall health? Um, well, I would, I would probably defer to my physical therapy colleagues who are fantastic at that. But, but in general, I, I mean, I think exercise is positive since cl- people with classic spinal stenosis and what we call neurogenic claudication, that those that the, have that shopping cart sign are probably not gonna do well with the walking program as nice as that is. They're probably not gonna do very well with the treadmill. However, they may be able to be just fine on a stationary bike where they're flexed forward. And in fact, if they're doing that and they're not getting problems in their legs, that's almost like a diagnosis of that problem. Um, so so those would be some you know um, hints there, but definitely um, I would, Uh, my goal would be to have someone with spinal stenosis work one-on-one with a therapist and have a customized treatment plan. Excellent. Um, It was a question about just clarifying what a slipped disc means and how that differs from spinal stenosis. So maybe one of you could speak a little bit about what that slipped disc refers to and um, how you differentiate. Sure, there's a lot of terms that are um, uh, used kind of casually, um, and even the radiology reports have a fair amount of subjectivity. So um, the disc has got an uh, an outer band um, of fibers and an inner soft core, and not to be graphic, but it looks a lot like crab meat. Um, So uh, when we take it out in the operating room, it's it's very white and it's a very similar consistency. So what can happen is that crab meat part, that nucleus pulposus, as we call it, can squeeze out of those fibers. And if it pushes out completely, um, that's a fragment of disc. We sometimes call it a free fragment and it produces horrible pain and irritation of the nerve. uh, if it if it bulges and the and that those outer fibers are intact, that can be called a herniation or a bulge. And there are some grading systems for that. Um, keep in mind that if 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 I were to take the people listening to this, including myself, and do MRIs um, of our all our lower backs, most of us would have some kind of problem with with our discs. They would be worn out or they would be bulging. Or so um, again, those those. Those MRI tests are wonderful and amazing, but they also show a lot of stuff that may not be causing us a problem right now. All right, you're ready for a tricky question. So we have Sarah Brown, who's a nursing student. um, And she said she doesn't know a lot about the subject and her question's a little 
off topic, but I think it's an interesting one. So I'll let you see if you can take a stab at this one. So in regards to traumatic brain injury, um, she's studying this in the beginning of her um, seminar here. She mentions that you, she's curious to know if there's a correlation between excessive sweating and traumatic brain injury. And thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. So um, do either of you, have you ever heard of a correlation between excessive sweating and traumatic brain injury? Uh, you know, I, I think there's some people with hypothalamic injury who can have issues with temperature regulation, but, but excessive sweating usually comes from, from a different etiology and, and there are a variety of treatments for it. Um, uh, um, so uh, I, I don't, I'd have to look up if there are case reports or anything. Uh, it's certainly not a, not a common sequelae, um, but that's a great question and, question. and, and it's really interesting. Yeah, don't, nothing that jumps to mind either as far as a direct to a connection there. I'd have to look that one up too, but we're learning new things all the time in medicine. So it's certainly possible. One thing to look at too, just if you're, um, you know, a nursing student, you're looking up some interesting neuro, you know, neurosurgical things um, would be Cushing's try it as well. Okay. There you go. So yeah, that, that definitely, up. that'd be some homework I would assign. Um, yeah. <laughs> a, classic, a classic awful neurosurgical uh, syndrome, but critically important if you're going to yes. be in the ER, if you're going to be in the ICU, if you know, you're going to be seeing patients with head injuries, um, uh, that, that's, that re refers to specific signs in someone who's about to die because of pressure in their brain and, and an alert nurse who can pick up these early signs and inform the team is going to save that person's life. So, um, uh, it's a, it's a, the, it's a really exciting and interesting um, to read about, but um, it, it definitely is knowledge that could save someone someday. So I, I definitely would look that up further. <laughs> I always yep, found yeah. that interesting in nursing school as well. So, you know, nice. yeah. Yeah. I typed it into the little chat box for Sarah to look up and I can tell you firsthand as an emergency doc that when a nurse comes up to me and says, something's making me nervous about this patient, I just don't like the way they look, or maybe very specifically this patient's exhibiting some things um, and X, Y, Z is why I'm worried. Um, the only question I ever have for them is which room point me the way let's start walking. Let's walk and talk. Like, let's move. Come on. Where are we going? Show me where I'm headed. Uh, it's the only kind of questions I ever ask because um, no, no question about it. That uh, the experience that you get and just all that information that you read about, um, you can really cue in and sometimes you can save somebody's life in a time sensitive emergency. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So one of the questions that I definitely had and um, Eric Gabrielson who works with me, not surprisingly asked to is some prevention stuff. So all right, we love what you guys are doing. It's amazing, but how the heck do we stay away from you and not need to have surgery? So what are some ways we can prevent spinal stenosis or prevent these sorts of problems from happening um, before we get symptoms or be diagnosed? Anything we can do on the preventative side? Sure. So, I mean, first I'm going to give a shout out to my primary care colleagues and say that whatever your primary care doc is telling you to do, do it because it's what, what they're telling you to do um, because it's good to lower your blood pressure and avoid diabetes and been, and is good for stroke prevention is actually going to be the same stuff that's going to be great for your spine. So an ongoing exercise program, keeping your weight within a normal range, um, proper diet with calcium and, you know, vitamin D through appropriate foods or supplementation if that's necessary. Um, avoidance of smoking. I, I, I couldn't say that enough times. Um, all of the pain clinics are filled with smokers. Um, my multiple spine pa surgery patients, mostly smokers. It's, it's a really, really tough disease. So um, uh, I always talk to people about, you know, kind of an analogy with cardiac issues, right? You can be, you know, perfectly healthy and a marathon runner and still have heart disease. But if I take a thousand of those people and I put them next to people who are heavy smokers, and don't move, we're going to certainly see a big difference in that disease process and, um, and, and, and spine is similar. But you can have just bad luck with genetics and do everything right and have a spine problem. Um, and that's okay as well. But definitely um, being proactive and focusing um, on health um, and prevention is critically important. Awesome. Thank you. Um, probably have time for one more question. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit to sort of what services are available at Newport Hospital versus maybe at some of the other hospitals up in Providence or that you work. So do you do all neurosurgery type things at Newport or are there certain ones that you do and certain ones that we need to go somewhere else for? Sure. So right now we're really focusing on um, more of the, the very common spinal surgery um, things, including cervical fusions, um, uh, lumbar surgeries, some of the more complex uh, lumbar cases with instrumentation, we're still, uh, you know, doing up in Providence. 
Um, the uh, implants of the stimulators and pumps right now are um, just in, in Providence, although I'm hoping uh, that I'm going to be able to bring some of the evaluation process for in particular the baclofen pumps uh, to Newport. We actually have some kind of exciting but very new plans for that um, coming up in the next month. Um, and so that, that spasticity uh, program, a piece of it is going to be at Newport, although the surgical implantations will be up in Providence, but we're hoping more of those patients can have more and more of the evaluations and uh, some of the follow-up uh, in our Newport location. Awesome. And then uh, I guess one more, just for, since we have a couple minutes left, any resources that you either like um, for yourself or that you tend to refer patients? So where can folks find you or find out more information? And then are there some resources that you tend to point folks towards so that they can read more about these topics or educate themselves a little more if they have curiosities? Kristen, you want to, you want to, uh, maybe uh, we could type in the knowyourback.org and do you have some yeah, other questions? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll put that in there. And that's a really a great website. And, you know, you introduced me to that website as well. And I found that very useful. And I know patients have actually, you know, put a lot of feedback to me in regards to it. And they found it very helpful as well. I think, I I think there are some books that Dr. Scarfo and some of the other Spine Institute people recommend for people who kind of want like a longer in-depth approach. Um, I think the internet, you know, I mean, I, I think again, there, there may be a, a large volume of information and you have to kind of ask yourself what kind of learner you are. I have patients who literally will sit and watch YouTube videos with blood everywhere and every detail of the surgery and they love it. And I have patients who really, you know, do not want to hear the more graphic details of the procedure. So if you're someone who wants kind of targeted information um, uh, rather than just drinking from a fire hose, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's helpful to go to some of the uh, websites like knowyourback.org. Uh, a lot of the major teaching hospitals, our Brown Neurosurgery webpage has, uh, has some really interesting information and videos on it. Um, so those are some resources. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. I know you're very busy neurosurgeons and folks of your type tend to be busy folks doing a lot of important things. So we really appreciate the opportunity for our community to be able to have an opportunity to sit and have a chat with you. And I always learn a ton during these sessions and this one was no different. So I really appreciate that. Um, certainly would encourage folks that if you're having any of the symptoms or any of the concerns, then definitely have a conversation with your primary care doctor. If you're really concerned, then certainly reach out and you can get directly in contact with the um, Norman Prince um, Neuros Neuroscience and Spine Institute at Newport Hospital. So you can go to newporthospital.org um, and you can see what the services and availability is there. Um, we're certainly excited to kind of keep this series going with the community lecture series, and hopefully um, everybody finds this to be beneficial. You get to see some of the expertise that we're really fortunate to have at Newport, which is always amazing to me, and also get a sense of, you know, what we're doing at the hospital and what the, what the possibilities are, what treatments and things we offer, which is great. So thank you both again so much for taking the time this evening out of your busy schedules um, to go through this presentation, to educate us all, and to take some time to answer questions and things. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Awesome. Thank Everybody you. have a great night and we'll see you again next time. Thanks. You too. Bye.